Good evening and welcome everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Yolanda Bota. I'm the pro project manager at Wright Milner. There have been a few get together courses recently and it's so good to feel normal again. As I said many times before, restorative dentistry remains a hot topic and we need to keep up with the latest evolution and trends. Thank you so much for making the time in between load shedding to join part two of Dr. Lewis McKenzie's webinar called Posterior Restorations. Restoration, re restoring a posterior teeth always carries a few challenges. For example, the contact point, the shape, the occlusion, etc. And therefore, special care should be taken when restoring posterior teeth. Dr. Lewis McKenzie will present, and after the lecture, we will have a question and answer session. So feel free to load your questions in the question column during the presentation. This webinar is sponsored by STI Dental, and Wright Milner is the exclusive agent for all STI products in South Africa. Now, just to give you a little bit background about Dr. McKenzie, he has been a general practitioner for 30 years, a clinical lecturer at the University of Birmingham School of Dentistry and at King's College London. He is also the head dental officer at Dentplan, the UK's largest provider of dental capitation plans. Thank you, Dr. McKenzie, for taking time out of your busy schedule to educate us. So please sit back and enjoy the webinar. I would like to welcome Dr. Now on the stage with me. Thank you, Yolanda. I'll just uh, share my uh, share my screen. Thank you. There we are. Okay. So hopefully you can see that now uh, let me just make that a bit bigger. i can see you i can see your presentation thank you okay great yep i'm just um, just making it a bit bigger can you see that full screen Yolanda? no it's not full screen yet okay sorry excuse the uh, the technical uh, <laughs> the technical adjustments <laughs> um there we are. Can you see that full screen now? It's uh, yes, thank you. Great, and I'll just move the slide. Can you see the slide moving? Yes, thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Yolanda. Uh, I've been learning all about uh, load shedding, so uh, uh, we'll move nice and quickly while we've all got some uh, some power. But it, it's lovely to be back virtually in south africa i'd love to actually be there the weather in england is predictably terrible uh, but then again it is most days of the year so um so welcome to posterior restorations uh, and a big thank you to yolanda to celeste and mariska uh, for um for hosting this webinar this evening so it's a, a delight to be back if you were here here for part one when we looked at the uh, the, the front teeth we'll be looking at the back teeth today but if if not don't worry um they're both uh, they're completely separate so yep uh so sort of uh, various different jobs i work at Demplan. that's the birmingham dental school there in the in the center of um in the center of england if you haven't been uh and and nowadays i'm a part-time gdp but all the the cases that you'll see are from my practicing career where I've worked in the same place for continuously for now 31 years uh, so um, so they're all, all my own cases so uh, aims and objectives going to talk about most different uh, materials uh, look at tooth prep uh, isolation techniques bonding and matrix techniques as uh, uh, as well and then really going to cover uh, most materials with step-by-step -step cases, starting off with silver diamine fluoride, which you may or may not be familiar with, um, uh, amalgam, which of course we're all familiar with, um, uh, composite, 
uh, be a strong focus on posterior composites, but also uh, glass ionomer as well, particularly with uh, an SDI sort of base presentation. They do make some absolutely stunning uh, glass ionomers. Um, and then we'll finish off with an indirect case where we'll look at crowns, inlay, uh, onlays and inlays, uh, all in fact in, uh, in, <laughs> in one patient as, uh, as well. So that's the plan for today. Um, as Yolanda said, if you have got any questions, please type those in to the, uh, the, the chat box and we'll take those questions uh, at the end. Uh, I'll ask a couple of questions during the, sorry, apologies for that. Um, uh, uh, so um, I'll ask a couple of questions as, as we go along for those watching uh, on uh, on demand um, and um, give the uh, give the question uh, the, the answers at the end okay so uh, so big thank you uh, to to right Milners and uh, and to SDI for supporting the the webinar and hosting the webinar this evening uh, SDI is um, Australian company, been around since the, the 70s. Uh, I've been around since the 60s myself, but uh, the late 60s, I hasn't, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, don't hesitate to mention. Uh, but uh, And they make a full range of restorative products, which uh, many of you be familiar with, but if, but if you're not, uh, then I'll be introducing them to you this evening. Uh, so composites, amalgams, um, uh, bonding, uh, bonding resins, glass ornaments, um, and uh, so uh, we'll be covering... Uh, a whole range of restorative materials. So I'm going to start sort of um, start simple, really, um, with um, sort of mi minimally invasive techniques with a look at silver diamine fluoride. Um, now, Reva Star, which again, if we're in the same room, it would be absolutely lovely to sort of uh, you know show of hands how many of you already used this material. Now it's got different license uh, licensing. It was got lots of different applications. It's been around uh, in many parts of the world for uh, for decades. Certainly in the in the UK at the moment, it's only licensed for treatment of sensitivity. Uh, but its main use, sort of internationally, is for the the, the management of uh, arresting caries, our, our arch enemy. So now in England. Um, and, and, um, and indeed uh, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, dentistry was closed down last year for three months. You couldn't do any aerosol generating procedures at all. Uh, this created obviously a, a massive backlog uh, and the, the British Dental Association, uh, their latest figures show that there's 35 million missed dental appointments, which is going to take uh, at least a year or two uh, for the profession to catch up on. Uh, and of course, a lot of patients in this time uh, were having uh, were having painful teeth, were having uh, sort of sensitivity, having cusps fracture off, uh, and so this particular uh, patient, where we've got some exposed dentine and some early um, uh, secondary caries um, there. Um, we weren't able to do any drilling, uh, but the nice thing is about SDF, you don't need to. It's um, if you're in that situation where you just want to arrest a lesion, uh, then you can just place it directly on the lesion. So dry the cavity first of all. You can see I've used a little bit of um, liquid dam there, which comes in the kit. Um, and then you've got two options. You've got uh, well, there are two two stages to it. There's the first uh, the first stage, which is the the SDF silver diamine fluoride itself uh, and so dry the tooth place the SDF, SDF uh, and also Reva comes with a, a second bottle or a second capsule which is potassium iodide and place that and that will reduce the amount of darkening that you get because it, it can sort of go quite uh, quite dark so and then this was the patient uh, afterwards uh, so stabilized sensitivity gone and then we can um, uh, uh, we can leave that until the uh, until dentistry started up again and uh, and restore appropriately. So as I say, we can't uh, use uh, SDF at the moment uh, generally for uh, for for fillings or underneath fillings or to arrest caries. Uh, but this this was a um, uh, this was me practicing with SDF on a carious extracted tooth, which tells you immediately oh, I've got far too much time on my hands. And so I should get out more and get a bit of a life. Uh, but again, it's a really good opportunity to practice on um, 
on extracted teeth. We're not, there's not many medical professions where we can uh, actually practice on bits uh, bits of patient. Um, but uh, and again, this shows the the placement of the SDF and then uh, what it looks like um, when we place the potassium iodide over the top as well. And then in this case, I'm restored with um, restored with composite. So again, uh, again, it'd be lovely to know when we can actually meet up. Uh, and hopefully I can come over to South Africa um, and then we can have a discussion about what the uh, what the state of play is. Um, with deep caries, it's not advised, if you're very close to the pulp, it's not advised to use SDF or, or on pulp or exposures uh, because we don't want silver ions uh, within, the, uh, within the pulp chamber. So that's SDF, so starting with a minimally invasive material. Let's then wind back the clock to the world's oldest direct restorative material, um, a, a, amalgam. Um, and so more than 150 years of, uh, of use. Um, now, uh, in, the, uh, in the United Kingdom, um, again, I'd love to know what's going on in, uh, in South Africa. In 2018, for the first time in history, uh, restrictions, legal restrictions were placed on the use of amalgam um, with the signing of the Minamata Treaty, which, um, which I'm certain South Africa signed again, 130 uh, countries, uh, countries did. Uh, and so in the UK at the moment, since 2018, it's illegal to, do, uh, to use amalgam on deciduous teeth, on children under 15, uh, on pregnant breastfeeding ladies but we didn't usually do that anyway uh, with the aim being to try and phase out amalgam by 2030. Uh, I think the general feeling is this, this is very unlikely to happen uh, and personally I would be disappointed if, if that did happen because amalgam remains the strongest and longest lasting direct restorative material that we've got um, and in big cavities particularly those when we've got moisture control issues um, I wouldn't like to not have amalgam in the um, uh, in the drawer. So, um, so as in this example here, which we can see is now a nice long-lasting restoration. That picture was taken at 12 years. Um, but just to boost the retention, because you see we haven't got much residual tooth tissue. The first thing was I, I cut some pits. I bonded the amalgam in place using Panavia. Although I'm going to be talking about lots of uh, SDI products. I'm also going to talk about lots of different products from different companies um, that you'll still be able to get from Wright uh, Milner's. Uh, Milner's um, and um, so bonded in place with Panavia, a material with MDP uh, in it. It's a QRRA um, uh, product and uh, used for things like resin bonded bridges. Um, they're non-precious alloy, but amalgams are non-precious alloy as well. So it's ideal for a bonded amalgam. And so um, now when it comes to amalgam, SDI is the world leader, the number one um, manufacturer of, uh, of amalgam uh, and two examples of materials which you may well be using uh, in practice at the moment. Again, when we meet up live and can actually uh, sort of speak properly, the first thing is I'll, I'll mainly do the listening, as I mentioned before, the South African accent is absolutely my favourite in the world. It is just so cool. Um, and I just love uh, to, to find out what the situation is with regard to composite, amalgam, other materials um, in, um, in South Africa. So let's now move on to composite, which of course has revolutionised restorative dentistry. So we'll spend um, quite a bit of time now looking at a few different cases uh, and starting small again. Uh, so we've got a cavitated lesion there. Um, and so uh, starting off again, if we're in the, in the same room, I'd ask you how many of you are using uh, magnification? Um, uh, to uh, to obviously improve decision making, improve outcomes with restorative dentistry, uh, but also to help us sit up straight and uh, and reduce the risk of musculoskeletal problems, which remains globally the number one reason for early retirement in dentistry. Dentistry is pretty bad on the um, uh, bad on the spine and musculoskeletal system uh, in, in general. Um, and so although the, 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 the pandemic is having a significant effect on, uh, uh, on the workforce, uh, retiring uh, those in a position to retire, had quite, quite a spate of early retirements and practice sales 
uh, sort of following the uh, following the pandemic as we as we crawl our so our way out of the pandemic. Just in the UK, out of interest now, there are almost no restrictions, uh, and and mask wearing is, is almost uh, non non existent. Uh, you, you'll have probably seen uh, an example of that when you saw uh, South Africa disappoint Wales massively. Sorry, I shouldn't be laughing uh, <laughs> uh, at, uh, at at the weekend, uh, but uh, but yeah, we're sort of trying trying to sort of drag ourselves back to a normality. The vaccination program is, is going incredibly well. So, uh, so magnification. So these are, these are my new loops. Um, well, I say new loops. I've had them for about three years now, but they're still new. That's new to me. Um, uh, but again, I've been using magnification for the last 25 years. And these were my first ever adjustable loops. I used 2.5 magnification for, for, over 20 years but these these are the new loops um, from uh, oroscoptic um, where you can have three four and five times magnification uh, depending on what you're doing uh, whether it's restorative or endo or, or other things uh, obviously you have to have the same magnification on both eyes otherwise you're your, your day in practice is like probably like a bit of an LSD trip or something like that. Uh, so, uh, but uh, but yeah, they're absolutely superb. And that, again, it'd be lovely to know how many of you are using magnification. Hopefully, loads. So we do our preparation. Remove, uh, get the margins completely clear, uh, pulpily. Uh, we can leave affected dentine, as as we know. We don't want to over prepare um, because the bacteria are going to be sealed in there and they're going to die off. Um, so we'll look at we'll look at a number of cases involving that. Now isolation. Uh, this is a really really nice uh, rubber dam clamp. Yep, I get excited about rubber dam clamps. Uh, the the soft clamp from Kerr is very uh, almost a universal clamp. Uh, molars, pre molars. Um, uh, again, uh, it's it's got these lovely curved tines, like, uh, which are slightly roughened, um, and so they'll fit on a uh, on a on a, obviously on a tooth like this, but also on an extra uh, on a, um, a partially erupted tooth, uh, on a badly broken down tooth as as well, um, and also if you if you're going without local, if you're doing sealants or PRRs or some air abrasion or something like that, um, it's not quite as wicked. As the, as the metal clamps uh, and so uh, so you can put it on usually without any local anesthetic uh, at all at all so the soft clamps really nice and obviously for a, for an occlusal we just need a single hole in the dam um, and that will give us our maximum isolation as we, as we see there now adhesives I'll be talking about lots of uh, adhesives uh, again uh, it's about as good as a uh, load sharing for making you want to turn off <laughs> uh, but um, shedding sorry uh, and um, but um, but self etch adhesives obviously they're designed to make our lives easier so we don't have to worry about phosphoric uh, acid etching in certain situations where and so we don't have to worry about washing and drying um, and over drying uh, being one of the main reasons for post-op sensitivity. So the nice thing about a cavity like this, it's got so much undercut um, that really we're not wanting a massive bond strength anyway. So we can use a self etch adhesive like uh, SDI's uh, Go, for example, um, which will uh, which will etch. Uh, it's a mild etch, so that'll etch the cavity anyway. Uh, but we know, don't need to wash it off and dry it. So it just makes it a lot less technique sensitive. Um, so, uh, and again, in a situation like this, uh, we don't need a crazy big uh, bond strength anyway. We need to evaporate the solvent, regardless of the, uh, of the material that we use, uh, which will evaporate the solvent and it will allow the uh, adhesive to penetrate the demineralized um, tooth tissue, penetrate the tubules, uh, and so that when it looks like cured, it will create that nice hybrid layer, which will reduce the risk of post-op pain. Then we'll light cure uh, the, um, uh, the, um, the material, um, just 10 seconds for our light cure. And then the ca whole cavity should appear glossy or shiny uh, before we start. And so then we know that we are ready to restore. If there are any dry areas, we can just apply some more adhesive uh, and just to make sure the whole cavity is coated with a nice shiny layer of adhesive. 
Then bulk fills. Again, if we're in the same room, I would ask how many of you are using bulk fill uh, materials. Um, they have um, uh, revolutionized posterior composites because you can put them all in in one go. Um, they've got low polymerization, shrinkage stress, so you're not going to get post-op pain. And Aura is the SDI example and simplified again, just has one universal shade. Uh, which works really, really nicely. Now, um, shaping the composite a bit before we light cure, especially with an occlusal, trying to do as much shaping as possible um, before we, uh, because if we've got a rubber dam on, we can't check the occlusion. So we want to get it pretty close, so it reduces the number of bulk adjustments that we have to do afterwards. This is a nice instrument that you can get from Wrights. This is part of the LM Arte range and this is one's once called a fissura um, and uh, and this is a really really lovely instrument for just shaping uh, in this case uh, on this lower seven this uh, hot cross bun this cruciform uh, fissure pattern nice and easy using the cusps as a guide because what we're aiming for of course is to minimize adjustment so that when we remove the rubber dam or if we haven't used rubber dam, um, it minimizes the adjustments anyway. Um, uh, so uh, back to uh, uh, back to the uh, the curing. So with with aura, you've got a five mil depth of cure. Um, so and there's not many cavities that are much deeper than that. And of course, if you have got a sort of a, a, an endo uh, access cavity, then of course you can just do it um, do it in one increment and then do it in another increment afterwards. Now shaping, uh, Wrights um, uh, work with Comet um, and have got a, a really beautiful range of, of burrs. I'm a big burr fan um, and, um, and so this is an absolutely superb one. You can see the code there, uh, which is designed purely for uh, fisher shaping. Um, and uh, it's an ideal shaped burr, really, really quick and easy. Just draw the fisher pattern in really, really quickly. Polishing as well. This is a uh, a Kerr um, uh, polisher, which enables you to get into the little nooks and crannies um, really easily into the depths of the fissures. And the nice thing about this, because it's autoclavable, so it's multiple use, but it doesn't go blunt either. So you can use this type of uh, loads um, before it needs re replacing, um, because quite often uh, if you're using a silicon point. Uh, once it's gone blunt, it won't really get to the base of the fissures anymore. With this type of brush, uh, which is silicon with diamond impregnated particles, uh, it works beautifully. So we've completed our class one composite. Uh, it's always going to look nicer than the, the adjacent amalgam. Hopefully the patient's not going to be able to uh, detect that. Uh, and obviously at the back of the mouth, um, uh, aesthetics function is more important than aesthetics. And even more important than that is minimally invasive dentistry. And if we just look at the, the two different cavities that have been cut for composite and amalgam, we can see a significant difference. Uh, cavities tend to be bigger for amalgam to give you that resistance and retention form. Uh, and so, uh, again, it's not so much looking at the material, but look at how much tooth is left behind when we go with composite over amalgam. Now, Aura, uh, which is SDI's bulk for material, it, bulk fill material is a nano, uh, a nano hybrid uh, material. So, um, uh, so uh, uh, that, that might be a good question. What does what does nano hybrid uh, mean? I'll uh, I'll give the answer right at the end. I better write down now before I forget. So a nano hybrid material, um, and um, dental advisors, which is a which is a group in the United States who uh, test uh, materials. Um, uh, uh, so this test was done in February. Thirty three dentists did. Um, uh, Six, uh, 657 fillings uh, and and then they report and this is a, obviously a really really high score 94 uh, percent uh, if uh, if there's a material they don't like you certainly won't uh, you won't be left wondering um, uh, you know they're really uh, they're really very good in them uh, and balanced um, because again uh, you know that, that that's their reputation is based on uh, testing materials uh, to a high specification 
Uh, and so the found have very good handling properties, very good adaptation to the cavity, non-sticky, which is of course what we want, um, and that the universal shade matched in the uh, in the majority of cases. It's around about an A2, but it blends well when you're moving away from uh, from from A2 as well. Most teeth are in the A range anyway, and as we know, uh, A2, A3 um, range will will solve the majority of problems with posterior teeth. So let's move on to class twos now, a bit more challenging because we can't see the, the caries. So here we've got a cavitated um, lesion. I say, how do we know that it's cavitated? Because it's only sort of looking maybe E2 in a half of enamel, maybe D1, difficult to tell on the, um, uh, on the, on the radiograph there. Um, but um, uh, tooth separation demonstrated that we've got a cavitated lesion. So we booked the patient in for some um, uh, uh, for, for class two composite. Now the problem is that when we start drilling in between the teeth that there is a massive incidence of iatrogenic damage as we'll know from our studies. Uh, most studies showing a hundred percent of the time the adjacent teeth show some sign of damage. So these are absolutely fantastic. Various different companies make them. These are the fender wedges from Director and these are restorative wedges are placed in between the teeth, virtually impossible to drill through, um, and they will help to protect the adjacent tooth uh, throughout of all stages of the preparation procedure. They'll also give you some tooth separation, so they'll help enhance your tight contact point by pushing the teeth slightly apart during the procedure. Also useful, things like end cutting burrs, especially if you haven't got a uh, uh, if you haven't got a, a, a protective wedge in place, a burr that's only got diamonds on the tip will be really useful for finishing the cervical margin if needed. And then a sectional matrix system. And again, I'd really, really love to be able to see you all to sort of ask for a sh show of hands how many of you are using a sectional matrix system. Again, the studies done in, uh, in the Netherlands demonstrating that this type of matrix will give you a tighter contact and better proximal contour than any other kind of matrix um, uh, on the market. This is the Garrison system. It's been slightly um, updated um, uh, since, um, since this picture was taken, but the principles are exactly the same. Small sectional matrix, um, nice wedge, plastic wedge in this example, contoured on the gingival surface, and then a separation ring. And the separation ring along with the wedge helps to separate the teeth um, uh, by pushing them apart, but also, as we can see here, creates that lateral seal so the composite's not going to escape out of the cavity. So now universal adhesives, um, I think, although we're all struggling with the, the national and professional crisis that is the global pandemic, um, but hopefully once the pandemic is in the rear view mirror, uh, I would argue there's probably never been a better time to be a dentist um, because uh, we've got so many different technologies. We've got minimally invasive dentistry. We've got adhesive technology. We've got uh, aesthetic dentistry, which has been taken to sort of unprecedented uh, levels. We've got digital dentistry, um, which, is, which is finally becoming uh, mainstream. So from a restorative point of view, uh, I think there's probably never been uh, a better time uh, to be a dentist um, in the history of dentistry. Again, once once we've got this this um, significant hurdle uh, behind us with the with the pandemic and universal adhesives are a good example of this. And this is a zip bond, uh, which is the SDI universal. Now, the definition of uh, a universal um, adhesive is a material that you can use as a self etch adhesive or you can phosphoric acid etch the whole cavity or you can selectively etch the cavity uh, and it will perform just as well in each of those modes so it gives you total flexibility depending on the clinical situation uh, that you you find yourself in so shaping, uh, this is a nice instrument and uh, Milner's um, sell, Wright Milner's sell the, the full set of five instruments from Coltine designed by Didier uh, Dietschy, who's one of the most amazing dentists in the world based in uh, on Lake Geneva. 
we're not on the lake obviously next to the lake um and um and, and he designed a um a series of five instruments composite shaping instruments uh, and this is a really nice one short flexible probe uh, with a pkt3 uh, um, tip uh, on the other end a short uh, a short cone um really nice instrument for just creating a little bit of shape there uh, before we light cure. Now those of you who have used this type of system will know um, that it generates such tight contacts that it can be very difficult to remove the, uh, remove the matrix. So it's always nice um, to have uh, some matrix tweezers as well. Uh, these ones are great because you can just punch them through the matrix uh, just uh, just like that really really easy to use you can use them for placement as well but it's really really handy uh, and it saves you having to to sort of fight with tweezers so that's our class two complete and the aim as as uh, as with the class one is to have to do the minimum amount of adjustment afterwards uh, as you see virtually no adjustment needed uh, for this restoration um, we want to preserve the maximum amount of tooth tissue we want a nice tight cleansable contact exactly as Yolanda said uh, you know that's one of the most important things uh, and it's one of the most difficult things uh, again studies showing that still one in four posterior composites suffer with open contacts the use of a sectional system completely eliminates that uh, and with a system like that you will never ever have an open contact uh, and again, those of you who are using that type of system, um, uh, again, will, will already be experienced the benefit. If not, a sectional system and a bulk fill material and a universal adhesive uh, will really, really uh, transform your posterior composites. So let's, let's go large now. Uh, and so here we have a tooth where all the restorations have, have been lost um, and it's completely flat. Uh, now, obviously, in the digital era now, we could just scan this, um, and I'm sure Wrights will be very happy to sell you one of their nice uh, scanners and milling, uh, milling machines. <laughs> um, but if you haven't got one, um, then you can still do these kind of cases directly in direct composite. Uh, again, the Dutch dentists have been doing this kind of thing now for, for over 20 years uh, and now are doing full arch reconstructions indirect composite with with fantastic results so the first thing to notice uh, it was originally an amalgam restoration and there was a pin in the um uh, there were two, well there was a uh, an amalgam post uh at distally so i've just literally just removed the amalgam off at gum level but there was also a pin there so i've removed the pin i've taken the pin out because we don't have any pins in composites um because it creates a stress line around which the composite can fracture uh, I often say to the students that I teach on the student clinic at Birmingham, if any of the other lecturers tell you to do a pinned amalgam, don't come and tell me, phone the police, uh, because that uh, that is a, a restorative crime. So we don't have pinned uh, composites in, in dentistry. So if this is going to work, we, we're going to use uh, a total etch adhesive we want to penetrate the enamel to 30 microns we want to maximize the bond to dentine so for this sort of cavity we want to use um, a total etch adhesive system uh, STI have the full range um, and uh, we want to use a nice matrix system this example is the auto matrix from dense supply Serona but equally the super mat system uh, from from Kerr, uh, these are two absolutely superb matrix systems for amalgam and composite, uh, and they really do eclipse the Seekland or the Toffelmeyer matrix system. They make your life so much easier because as you tighten them, they tighten cervically, and then they lean against the adjacent teeth, so they help you with your contact formation to begin with. To further assist your contact formation, then um, then you've got contact forming instruments such as the uh, such as the Trimax uh, instrument, which is made by Adent. Um, lots of different contact formers are available on the market. Um, Yolanda Celeste and Maresco, I'm sure, will be able to inform us what range they carry at um, at, uh, at Wright Milner's. Um, but whatever instrument you use, or even if you're just using a normal instrument, uh, the, the, the technique is to do one box at a time, force the instrument into the material, 
hold it as tight as possible against the adjacent tooth and then like your, as in this example with a Trimax, it's, it's got that prismatic tip. So you just like your through the back of the instrument or uh, if you're using a metal instrument just from the, from the side. Um, and then you repeat for the other contact as well. So you've guaranteed tight contacts right at the start of the restoration. The other thing that does is, as I'm sure we're all experienced uh, in this, is when you've got a whole tooth build up to do, sometimes even with a nice matrix like this and some nice wedges like those flexi wedges um, there, is you've still got the problem uh, of the matrix moving about a bit uh, on you. So the beauty of by placing the comp composite in increments like this is it also stabilizes the matrix. So the composite becomes part of your matrix system. So then we can just build the whole cavity up using a bulk fill material, uh, all in one uh, increment if we want to, or incremental if, if it's a different material, um, and then overbuild it and then cut it back. But again, using our composite finishing burst, so we can do this incredibly quickly uh, by either punching the, the pit positions in place, as, as we see there, or by literally just dividing the tooth up uh, into uh, sections. Uh, so, so we've got our, for example, this is a lower six, so we've got two lingual cusps and three buccal cusps. Now, the reason I'm a massive fan of posterior composites is because our composites will fit the tooth better than any technician's crown. Um, uh, it'll fit absolutely uh, perfectly. And the other thing is that we can design their restorations um, from an occlusal point of view uh, even easier than a technician because we've got the world's most accurate articulator sitting in our chair. So we can uh, control the intercuspal position or centric position, whichever, whichever you like to call it, or uh, MI, maximum intercuspation, whatever it happens to be called. We can just make sure it's perfect. Uh, and also that the restoration is perfect in lateral excursions as well. And of course, the great thing about composite is uh, that it's so flexible um, that, you know, we, we can add to it, we can repair, we can adjust it. Whereas with ceramic, the minute we adjust it, um, the abrasive surface literally goes off the scale. So, uh, yeah, we, we can design restorations that fit as, uh, as, as well as any restoration um, that's made in a laboratory. You could... if. We don't need to spend a lot of time polishing posterior composites um, and what you can do if you want to is you can use a, um, a composite sealer. Now this isn't bonding resin. It looks like it might be bonding resin, but it isn't. Because if we put bonding resin on the tooth, it might make it nice and shiny for a couple of weeks, but then it'll actually sh uh, it'll stain more because of the oxygen inhibition layer. So having a material like Biscover, which is a um, a bisc bisco product. Uh, this is a composite glaze, a polish, and you just literally just paint it on to the uh, to the composite um, and light cure it. You don't need to air thin it or anything like that. And this will give you no oxygen inhibition layer. So you'll get an absolutely perfect finish uh, that feels lovely and smooth to your patients um, and, uh, and it feels nice and smooth to the tongue and looks nice as well. It's important to monitor restorations over time. Um, and, and so here we see the restoration uh, a year down the line and four years down the line with some saliva left on it, which also uh, obviously helps <laughs> from an aesthetic point of view. But let's go even further. Um, uh, so we sort of need to design restorations that fit perfectly, aesthetically integrate, but also we need to design restorations that are easy to clean because the lifespan of the restoration, one of the most important longevity factors is how well a patient looks after it. So if we can design restorations that are easy to clean, don't trap food, um, train patients how to clean them nicely, then we will get restorations that last up to 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. So this case, that's a, that picture was taken at 10 years. The reason I've used this case, and you don't often see pictures like this on Instagram, uh, they're usually befores and afters within a matter of minutes. Um, 
but um, but by looking at restorations over time and photographing them and studying them, it helps make us make uh, helps us make better clinical decisions. Uh, and because one of the problems with composite is because you do obviously get stain um, uh, over over the years, um, then uh, you know amalgam looks rubbish from day one. Um, but but with composites, it's very important to uh, make uh, to ensure that stain is not incorrectly diagnosed as secondary caries because as we know from multiple studies way too many composites are replaced unnecessarily because of an indirect uh, sorry an incorrect um, diagnosis of marginal stain uh, of, of a secondary caries uh, which was actually just marginal stain so it's important to mo uh, monitor restorations uh, and uh, just just watch uh, and see how they go over the years. We can use um, composite um, now in, in high stress situations uh, that certainly when I trained um, as an undergraduate over 30 years ago, uh, composites just weren't around. Um, I did one as an undergraduate, one posterior composite as an undergraduate and uh, lower right six, I can still see it now, it's terrible. Um, but um, uh, but uh, uh, it just was kind of lucky when I did sort of uh, graduate uh, that um, posterior composites really arrived um, in, in the UK at around about the same time. So although we weren't taught as undergrads, um, we all rapidly realised that composite was the way forward uh, and much more minimally invasive with regard to tooth tissue. But we were taught way back that you couldn't do composites on patients with brux bruxism. But now, of course, again, the Dutch dentists, again, leading the world in research and practice have demonstrated that you can treat wear patients with, uh, with direct composite. Um, and, um, and so this patient who's a bruxist, uh, a cusp had broken off, a common clinical situation. Uh, and so I've, I've cemented a fiber post. Uh, it's a root filled tooth. So I've cemented a fiber post, restored the, restored the tooth. I'd probably cap the cusp as well. Um, but this was quite a long time ago. And here's the restoration eight years down the line. Um, and I think um, there's a good chance that in a bruxist that it wouldn't have lasted um, as, long as, it, uh, as long as it has. Um, uh, if, if I hadn't had the fibre post, just giving a little bit more resistance form. So if it's root filled, uh, then you can use a fibre post uh, nice, and, uh, nice and easily. So let's switch now to a material that you very rarely hear talked about in lectures. But of course, it's, it's, it's one of the most commonly used restorative materials in the, uh, in the world. Um, and SDI have got two absolutely superb glass ornament materials. And if you haven't used them before, I would most definitely recommend that you have a go with Reva. Uh, where well, you've got two options. You've got self-cure uh, and you've got light cure as well. Uh, the handling properties on both are amazing. And I would recommend that you do have both um, because they're you know, useful in, in different um, clinical situations. So if we look at that sort of cavity, um, and again, you know, if you've had a busy day in practice um, and you've treated uh, a case like this, your heart almost sinks, doesn't it? Because, you know, we can hardly see the cavity there uh, for, all the, for all the plaque and the biofilm, but we know that this is going to be difficult dentistry um, from an access point of view, from a moisture control uh, point of view, and from a restorative point of view. Uh, so, so for me, in these cases, glass anima is my number one choice of uh, material. Um, that's a really nice burr. Again, these are all burrs that you can get from uh, from rights, and uh, and you've got the different um, uh, you've got the, uh, the the codes, the burr codes on there. That long shank burr, brilliant for endo access, but it's also fantastic for these kind of cases and for root caries. Um, and um, it just, just gives you access to places where it's pretty difficult to get in. Now, as we can see, this is a pretty deep cavity. That's very, very close to the pulp, and I, I was certain that if I excavated any further, obviously by this stage I'm using hand instruments, uh, that I would expose the pulp, 
Uh, and so uh, the nice thing about glass armor, it's a sealed restoration. Um, so compared to amalgam, it's going to give you a, a better seal. Moisture control, we can see we're subgingival. We're probably getting on for two millimeters subgingival. Um, uh, and so, uh, so uh, again, obviously we could do a little gingivectomy or some electro surgery there. Um, but I find retraction cord is a really, really, rubber dam is going to be no good to us at all there. There's just no way, the rubber dam would literally just cut the cavity in half and, and we wouldn't have any clue what we're doing unless we use, used a clamp with a, that was a tissue retractor as well, which is not going to be easy on a lower seven. Um, so, uh, so for me, retraction cord packed into the sulcus, soaked in astringent. That's my favorite retraction cord um, there, which is the, uh, the Ultradent um, uh, product. Packed in place with a cord packer, goes down in a few seconds. Immediate moisture control enables us to place the composite, uh, sorry, the amalgam. <laughs> We got there in the end, the glass anima. We place the glass anima in conditions because we've got to have moisture control. For glass anima, it's an acid base reaction. The minute we've got any moisture knocking around, uh, then it's just not going to set properly um, and it's just going to degrade, start degrading almost immediately. Equally with glass anima, it likes a little bit of humidity as well. So this is an ideal sort of cavity for, for GI. We let it. We, we either let it set using the self um, cure material, or light cure it. Uh, and again, what I would usually do is is light. Uh, I'd use Reva uh, LC light cure for this one. So then you light cure the material, and then you can just get on uh, and do the adjustment immediately with these nice again tricky dip, tricky area to get to uh, with normal length shank burrs. Um, but we can just get in nicely going uh, red, 50 micron, um, and then uh, yellow, 25 micron burrs for shaping with red, and then fine smoothing. And you'll notice I've left the retraction cord in place um, throughout the adjustment procedure as well. It's not going to cause any harm at all, and it's going to keep those soft tissues retracted, and it's going to give me visual access. And these restorations just work. Uh, again, if you haven't used Reva before, just give it uh, give it a go. You'll absolutely love it. It's it's handling properties are absolutely uh, fantastic. Really, really easy to mix and to use and to uh, and to apply. So as we see, the patient's doing a reasonable job of looking uh, of looking after it. Uh, we've got no positive edges on the restoration, um, and um, uh, but again, um, it's uh, it, it's it's an area that still needs constant uh, monitoring um, uh, but uh, again with glass armor nobody really knows it's diff it's impossible to actually test the, the fluoride uptake the fluoride release of the materials but we know it is a very biologically friendly material and the bond because of the acid base reaction um, uh, and the fact that you've, you've got these, these this bond uh, with the the smear layer You've got that constant ion exchange between the material and between the tooth, to the tooth itself. But a tough, tough cavity to treat. Uh, but uh, but again, um, I think it's important that we don't just show things that look really, really nice. Uh, and, and aesthetically, we could we could put on the Style Italiano website. I think it's important uh, that we we look at cases of, of of you know tricky stuff as well as the stuff that's more highly aesthetic. Now, glass armor, of course, uh, you know, we're talking about individual materials, but materials can be used in combination as, as well, um, as, as in this example. Now, this was this was a deep cavity uh, isolation um, using the uh, a V3 sectional matrix system there, which you can get from Densply Serona and you can also get from uh, well, it's Optident in, in the uh, in the UK. Um, which is a really fantastic matrix system uh, uh, again. And you can see we've got a, a lovely lateral seal there, but we've got a pretty deep cavity. Uh, and again, this was a cavity where I thought, if I excavate any further, then I'm gonna expose this pulp. And if I expose this pulp, it's a symptomless tooth. It's amazing, isn't it? You know, how much care is you can get with no symptoms. It's symptomless and it's vital. So uh, again, if we look at the textbooks, if I expose that, that, that's not a carous exposure, that's an iatrogenic exposure, because this, this 
tooth can fix itself if we create the right environment. So in this example, I did an indirect pulp cap um, using, um, uh, using uh, glass ornament material, pack that in place, allow that to set, and then um, uh, as, it, as it says there, um, I can't actually see, I can just about read that. Sorry, I've got a little, um, I've got a little strip in front of that. Sealing effective denting prior uh, to, to placing restoration will seal the, seal the cavity and arrest the lesion. Once those bacteria are sealed in there, they're going to die. They're cut off from their nutrient source. So it doesn't really matter how many we leave behind because they're all going to die anyway. And we're going to create that nice seal. Uh, if you're using glass armor, then um, uh, then ideally try and keep the etch off the glass ionomer. You're not going to be able to eliminate it completely. Then we can place our bonding resin and then we can restore our composite. Uh, and again, that is uh, uh, the, the SDI. Those of you who are here for the anterior um, uh, evening uh, talked about aura a lot. And so this, this is, all, uh, uh, again, all a really lovely material, uh, which you've got, you've got a nice, easy, uh, shade taking uh, system as well so you can get a nice color match you can get really close to the tooth tissue so we can spot the restoration but the patient's really not going to be able to see where this restoration is hiding at all and again it's minimally invasive dentistry it's maximized the amount of residual tooth tissue um, it's sealed the cavity uh, and, and so it stopped the disease um, and again we want it to last for many many uh, years and decades so we're doing pretty, I think we slight, started slightly uh, late. Um, so uh, we're doing pretty well for time, uh, but we're on to our last, um, our last case. Uh, and we're looking now, uh, again, we've covered the whole range, uh, but now we're gonna look at indirect. Uh, and this is a useful case uh, for me to show uh, because it's, uh, it, it ended up showing three different types of restoration in, in one particular quadrant. The patient had come in with pain pain on pressure on that inside cusp. And as we can see there, uh, again, this is where photography comes in really useful. Useful. We can show the patients those crack lines. So they're left in absolutely uh, no question about what is causing their pain. Um, and so we've got those crack lines. And so uh, this patient happened to be a dentist uh, and um, uh, asked uh, if, if they could also have the crown the gold crown replaced with a tooth coloured restoration um, and indeed the amalgam replaced with a tooth coloured restoration as well, although they were functionally fine. A bit of marginal ditching around the amalgam, but again, that's not caries, that's just that's just ditching. Uh, so, uh, so it's three restorations in one quadrant, which creates a number of challenges, not least from an occlusion, occlusion point of view. So all the teeth are still responding to, uh, to uh, a pulp test. So we'll do that first of all, mandatory uh, pulp test, mandatory periapical radiograph before any indirect restoration. So we look at the occlusion. Now the problem is if we're dealing with three restorations in one quadrant, if we're gonna prep these three teeth, we risk losing all of the occlusal stops on one side. So it's important to take uh, the uh, uh, an occlusal record before we start um, and uh, mark it with articulating paper and ideally mark um, uh, uh, photograph that photograph that so we can see where the marks are to begin with and we're going to try and copy those um, throughout the restorative cycle and uh, now I, I would recommend to you red articulating paper that stuff is called Bausch articulating paper uh, and it's 40 it's 40 micron uh, articulating paper. So I'd most definitely recommend uh, no, no thicker than that. Um, as you know, you can get some articulating papers. You could, you know, you could take them down to the, to the, to the beach at Cape Town and do some surfing on them. They're so, uh, uh, they're so thick. We want to be nice and thin. Um, and so it marks, and I, I would recommend to you red uh, articulating paper um, because that will give you, uh, uh, that, that shows up better on metal restorations than, than blue often. So we take our occlusal records before we start. Um, uh, if we're going to change the, we want to preserve the patient's occlusal scheme. So 
um, I'm taking the photographs there you can take video as well if you want so you don't change uh, the, the patient seclusion you know how you started out and I've done a face bow transfer uh, there um, with um, uh, for, for this patient uh, and so we're going to be able to mount the the models in a much more realistic uh, arrangement so um, shade next now they're posterior restorations um, so we don't need to be terribly fussy about shade but I did um, um, uh, uh, got my technician uh, that's that, that's my technician um, Rob who's who's come to to take the shade he's, he's a fantastic technician <laughs> those are all his shade tabs there that's not his whole set he's got way more uh, he's got way more than that and, and that's one of his shade prescriptions um, there um, and um, so um, uh, so we're using a color uh, corrected light source um, and so uh, I'll ask another question, which I'll give the answer to at the end, um, with the colour temperature uh, of um, 5,200K. Uh, um, uh, uh, and, and the question would be, what, what, does, uh, what does that relate to? What does 5,200K um, light source relate to? So there you go. You've got two questions. The first one was about nano hybrids, and the second one. Uh, was about um, uh, was uh, about uh, the um, 520 uh, 5200k answers coming in just a minute at the end but if you look at that shade prescription there I mean it looks like a recipe for a cake um, <laughs> it's really delicious uh, I don't know do you have bake-off in, uh, in where you are in in South Africa uh, that's that seems to be uh, sort of uh, almost uh, fanatical interest in in a baking <laughs> a baking program on uk tv we do have very bad weather uh, so we do have to stay inside a lot so uh, so, so please forgive us for uh, for, for that uh, so uh, so um uh, so so again i love working with rob because he's an absolute master uh, of of his of his craft uh, and so he's taking the shade and doing the shade prescription so now core materials Again, sometimes we're, we're actually creating a foundation and obviously amalgam is going to be the strongest core material. Composite's going to be great because uh, we can set it straight away and it's a very hard material. But also, if we're not relying on the strength of the material, we could use a glass anima or a resin modified glass anima. But with the important proviso that these are weak materials, so if we're only relying on them for, for strength, uh, then we should either go with amalgam or composite. But this case, as we can see, we can see why the patient was in pain, um, that one cusp came off straight away when the restoration was removed, and then the other cusp pinged off uh, almost immediately afterwards. So now we, we've, we've lost quite a bit of residual tooth tissue. Um, uh, and so I chose to do an onlay preparation um, and by doing an onlay, I was happy to use uh, a glass anima material. And so I've placed the glass anima material there and, uh, and then shaped it up um, uh, as a, uh, as this is a sort of a, a provisional restoration and then getting the patient back to, um, uh, to, uh, to prep the teeth. So next job was again uh, and i immediately regretted agreeing to remove this restoration because it was an absolute nightmare to get that crown off this was years ago i can remember it uh, i can remember it now uh, it was really really thick so i thought oh there's not going to be much residual tooth tissue under here and there wasn't and it fitted like a glove i mean it was really really difficult uh, to uh, to remove so i immediately regretted taking it off um, but obviously once it was off it was off so I've got to do something with it so we can see there's a lot of core material in there and so I've really removed all of that because I didn't place it I want to get down to uh, what see what the tooth's looking like now I'm going to remove the amalgam as well and I'm going to prep the seven we've already prepped the uh, you can't really tell from this angle but there's not much axial height to the um, to the to the six but if i'm going to be prepping five six and seven i'm going to lose the patient's occlusion 
uh, there's a really good chance that I'm going to change the patient's occlusion and I'm not going to be able to get it back unless I've got an occlusal record. So in this situation, a simple occlusal record was to use some Duralay, uh, which I'm sure you can get from Wrights. It's quite an old fashioned material, red acrylic. You can use it for uh, building uh, core uh, cores uh, for direct pattern uh, post and cores, as I'm sure you know. But this was a really useful material. Just pop on top of that prep and just get the patient to bite together. Um, and so then I've got a, uh, and then obviously they're going to send this to the technician and they can do exactly the same on the model. So they've got exactly the right intercuspal position. So then we do our preps, an onlay prep on the seven, trying to create, um, a, 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 remove a, a minimal amount of tooth tissue. It's not far off a full veneer preparation, but I'm calling that an onlay. Uh, a, a full veneer crown preparation for sure. And we can see we haven't got much axial height there. We had to cope with the prep that we've got. I've done my very best to try and upright the prep and enhance the margins. And on the five, um, I've done an inlay prep. Now I virtually do no inlay preps at, at all. Uh, direct composite is my favorite, but again, you know, the patient was a dentist with valid consent. Um, and uh, and so we came to an agreement that we would go uh, with, a, with an inlay, me having explained the fact that we're gonna to have to sacrifice more residual tooth tissue to get rid of the undercut. So we went onlay, crown, inlay. So one of the things about posterior indirect is we need enough room, we need enough space. So these are quite useful, these thickness gauges, and you can get these in one, 1 1.5 and two millimeters. Um, and Prestige is one company that make these. Uh, and they're really easy to use. You just get the patient to bite on them and then feel how easy it is to pull them, uh, pull them out. It's not an exact science. Because really, if we don't give the technician enough room, we're going to be there for hours adjusting the restoration. Um, uh, and, uh, and we want to be absolutely certain that the technician's got the room to do his or her um, wonders with, with ceramic. The provisional restorations. So I uh, did a pre-op um, impression to begin with in, a, in a, one of those quick trays from Kerr, a little sectional, sectional tray. Um, and uh, and use, use the same thing with those vents. You can just about see at the top, at the bottom, uh, the top of the bottom, the picture at the bottom on the right. Uh, you, I've just cut some vents. So place the acrylic material into position and I've just let it set, let it set in place, um, removed the, that, uh, the, the impression and I'm just gonna leave it like that. So they're not cemented in place, they're all joined together. And so the patient needs to know to keep it nice and clean but onlays of course uh, can be very difficult to temporize but not in this situation because everything was joined together so now again i mentioned digital before and i mean nowadays this would be an absolute perfect case for scanning um, you know super gingival margins uh, hopefully nice obvious margins as uh, uh, as well uh, th this this would be one that would just lend itself brilliantly to, to digital impressions. But I, I, again, I haven't and still haven't uh, got, uh, got that option. So just analog impression, but again, using uh, a one stage putty wash together. Um, that is generally considered uh, to be the most accurate rather than a two stage, which as we know, can create a number of different issues. Uh, and then over to Rob. Um, so send him the pictures, send him the impressions, send him the occlusal record. You can see how pleased he is to receive uh, all of these things. Uh, a real, uh, 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 absolute uh, delight to, to, to work with. Uh, and, you know, photographs all of his work. And I'd say, uh, if you ever get a chance to see Rob, he is an international lecturer. If you ever get a chance to see Rob do a lecture or an online lecture, uh, it's one of the, his lectures, some of the best I've ever seen. They are just so beautiful. So I'm going to go with lithium disilicate. 
um, for example, an Emacs um, uh, material, which is an Ivoclar material, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, and the nice thing about this, it's etchable. So we're going to be able to bond these restorations in place. It's super strong. It's not as strong as zirconia, but it's going to be more aesthetic than a full thickness zirconia and certainly easier to adjust and remove uh, if, uh, if, if need be. But what we're aiming for with these restorations is zero adjustment. We want to be able to try them in, patient to bite together, good old grind around, and feel absolutely perfect. So I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't created a little window in this patient's cheek, uh, but this is kind of demonstrating exactly what we're trying to achieve. The reason that we bothered with those records at the start was to make our life easier now. So we want to relate the upper cast to the hinge axis of the patient's jaw. And then we want to use our occlusal record to relate that lower model to the upper model on the articulator. So when the restorations are made in those conditions, they should fit perfectly, not just marginally, but they should fit perfectly occlusally as well in all excursions. So time to cement. We need to etch the, the restorations. This is done in the lab and make sure you know what your lab's doing and they will etch with um, hydrofluoric acid, not the chair side stuff that we can use, which I think I forget is either six or nine percent, but it's a low percentage. They etch with the stuff that's like, you know, the, the blood in alien uh, and aliens uh, and all the sequels, in fact. Um, and, and this is a, an etch that you absolutely can't get on your skin because you can't get it off your skin. And if you if you put water on it, it gets even worse. So, but this powerful acid used in the lab with care, I will etch the ceramic, um, which can then be primed with a silane primer, as, as, we, uh, as we see there. And so we're gonna get an incredibly good bond of our resin cement to the, uh, to the, uh, to the fit surface. It's nice if we can try them in with a trying gel. Um, to check the occlusion. What we don't want to do is cement them and have to adjust them after us. What we're looking for is zero adjustment. And the nice thing about trying gels, and obviously you can, you know, materials like Nexus from Kerr, Calibra from Demsply Serona. Um, you can place these inside the restorations and they'll stay put. So you can get the patient to bite together. You can have a good old grind around uh, and they're not, not, not going to have any problems. Um, uh, checking the occlusion. Um, and um, so you can use things like KY jelly as well. It's got to, it, don't use things like Vaseline. Uh, it's got to be water soluble. So you can use things like um, KY jelly, for example. Uh, so, uh, so place the restorations, make sure they fit. Now, cementing, we've got loads of options. Now, um, uh, SDI makes some really, really lovely looting resins. We looked at those in the anterior course that we did previ previously. They've got a brand new one called Reva Sem, which is a resin modified uh, glass arnima, like as is uh, Reva Lutin Plus. So again, we could use those options. Uh, but in this particular case, I chose to use a resin cement um, just from a sort of a bonding point of view, from an aesthetic point of view. Obviously, we need, you know, really good uh, moisture control to uh, to do that. Super gingival margins, of course, will always help us in, uh, in, in that respect. Um, so so this is a set um, uh, and uh, it's uh, set resin um, cement. Uh, and so it, it's got those where well, you've got a choice. Uh, you've got the uh, unit dose, uh, but you've also got the mixing tip as well. So whichever you fancy, again, it's another, uh, this is a five star product from uh, from dental uh, advisors. So again, many of you may be using it already, uh, but if not, definitely worth chatting to your, uh, to your rep at, uh, at, at rights and, um, uh, and have a go with it and see what you think. So aesthetically, we've had an improvement in aesthetics for sure. Um, Metal-based uh, restorations are now ceramic restorations. So we've got an aesthetic improvement absolutely no adjustment to the occlusion at all. Fitted perfectly, zero adjustment, working with Rob um, is an absolute delight. Um, pictures, maybe for some angles that the, the patient will never ever see this angle. Uh, so again, just to uh, you know, show, I mean, this patient was a dentist, so was, was 
sort of uh, much more interested in what they look like. But I think all of your patients are interested uh, in in what they're having uh, in what they're having done, um, and they're never going to get this view without you taking a nice picture of it. Um, so also very useful for your portfolio uh, as well. Um, if you're building up your portfolio for your website, uh, obviously with the patient's uh, written permission to use them, uh, social media, um, uh, just advertising your wonders. So, so this is the restoration, well, these are the restorations at five years. And interestingly, the, the, the patient actually said, oh, can you replace the crown? I'm really pleased with that. Can you replace the crown on the other side? to which i said no i don't want to you saw how difficult it was for me to get that gold crown off let's wait if it comes loose one day let's take it off off then um and so um so we've left that we've left that uh, gold uh, gold crown there hopefully for the for the time being because it was such a well-fitting uh, crown on the other side uh, and 10 years down the line um, pop tests, everything's still vital. We've got a little bit of marginal stain uh, again, but they're doing the job. Uh, we've got some crack lines around the inlay. They were probably there to begin with, I suspect, um, uh, but they'll have certainly got worse over the years. Uh, and so that's, that is one of the reasons for me that I will tend to uh, do an onlay, um, uh, cap the cusps, or use a direct restoration or a combination of the two and cap the cusps with a direct restoration as, as well. And again, just monitor these restorations, see how they go with, with time. Um, uh, again, not just a, an, a, a visual examination, but again, our, uh, our radiographic examination at justified intervals as well. Again, it's always really nice if you've got a radio opaque cement as well or we need a radio opaque composite because it really does assist on the the monitoring uh, of the ceramic restorations and of course one of the advantages of uh, radiolucent ceramics and composites uh, is is you can see uh, you can see what's what's going on um, um, uh, better under the uh, residual uh, in, in this case we can actually see the residual tooth tissue so 10 years down the line and hopefully There'll be some pictures 20 years down the line uh, at some stage. So that's it. So we've, I think we've run just a, a couple of minutes over. We started a little bit later, but we're not far off the, uh, we're not far off the, the hour. Um, hopefully we've ticked the boxes. We've looked at materials, preparation techniques for direct and indirect. We've looked at isolation, talked quite a lot about bonding, um, some matrix techniques. And then we've looked at, we started off with SDF, um, the old favourite amalgam, quite a few posterior composite cases, some glass arnima cases, and we've finished with the case that we just saw uh, using um, uh, sort of step-by-step uh, -step techniques to optimise the control, particularly of the occlusion, but also aesthetics, also bonding um, uh, for, a, for three different indirect restorations. So that brings us to the end. I'd just like to thank you for your time. I hope that the load shedding has not impacted your uh, enjoyment. Uh, uh, and um, and uh, a massive thank you to, to Rights and to, to SDI for, for supporting this webinar, but also for making all these amazing products, which just make life in practice uh, just, just an absolute uh, pleasure. Love having nice materials, equipment, and techniques. We've got two questions. Um, so um, my colleague um, Yolanda or Celeste will tell me when she wants me to give the answers to those questions, or indeed if she does want me to give the answers to those questions. No. Um, Dr. McKenzie, thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask you to repeat the questions. So if we email the customers tomorrow, we um, they can send us their answers back. We're going to email them the two questions together with their CPD certificates. And I believe there is uh, one or two prizes to be won. Ooh. So um, if you will, just repeat the two questions. Okay. Question number one. Um, uh, what, um, from a materials point of view, does a, a nano hybrid mean with regard to the filler particles um and the second question the um 
color temperature um, 5200 uh, Kelvin what does that relate to and uh, we'll we'll keep you in suspense uh, Yolanda will release those answers I'll just go and look them up in the textbook just to make sure that they're absolutely correct <laughs> uh, and then um, uh, and then hopefully you'll uh, 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 lucky one or I don't know, lucky two of you will win a prize thank, thank you, you. Um, I think you would all agree, thank you for staying on, I think you would all agree it was once again a very informative uh, webinar. I think you've covered everything so well, there are no questions. Oh, great. Um, you've mentioned the River Star. Reichmullis has recently launched the River Star. What a phenomenal product. In fact, the World Health Organization recommends glass ionomer and silver diamine fluoride on the core list of essential medicines for prevention of treatment of dental caries. The STI River Star that you spoke about, like you said, contains 38% contains silver uh, fluoride. Uh, Dr. McKenzie, thank you also for emphasizing the contacts. When we first launched uh, the sectional matrices, I took 12 random people and was shocked to hear that eight out of that 12 people complained about having a food trap or, um, you know, a food impaction after receiving a restoration from a dentist. So with regards to the Paladin V3 from Dentsply Serona, um, Wright Milnes has got the phenomenal deal force from Clinician's Choice with brilliant rings, wedges and matrices. You also spoke about a uh, retraction cord. Please ask your right Milner sales rep about the new Circamet 000, 000.0 cord. It's the only company that makes uh, the 000, 000.0 cord. And uh, yes, Riva Glass Anonymous are one of our top best sellers from right Milner's, but we will email all this information of these STI products. Um, to the customers. Yeah. Let me just see if there's any questions. Um, amazing products, and Dr. Comrex said there's uh, again a lot of customers thanking you, uh, Dr. McKenzie. And I hope now that we hopefully returning to more normality that we will see you in South Africa soon. I would absolutely love that. And then we can only speak Afrikaans. <laughs> uh, uh, during so the, during the we will season. email the questions to them tomorrow and um Maris the email will come from Mariska and she will email the questions and they can reply on that and we will um do some lucky draws. No one Thank has you. any questions for Dr. McKenzie before he goes. Nothing. Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. It's great to see you all. Thank you. Thanks very much. Can I my end, Yolanda? Doctor McKenzie? Yep. Yeah. Hi Mariska. Can I you see I'm sitting in the dark? <laughs> yeah, little... I'm as well. <laughs> Um, can I ask you to email me those questions? Yep, will do. Thank you. And then I will get the answers from you whenever you've sorted it out in your handbooks. <laughs> it won't take long. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. But yeah, thanks ever so much for asking me. Yeah, really enjoyed it. And uh, Definitely. Yeah, get to, I was, get I was an assistant uh, up until about a month ago. I was Sorry, a dental assistant. I was a dental assistant up until a month ago for about 11 years. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. So your your yes. product knowledge yes. is going to be off the scale. So uh, yes. yeah, you speak, speak the same language. Definitely, definitely. But I had some very great uh, mentors, I must say. Brilliant. But this brilliant. was great. Thank you so much. Lovely to meet you. Nice. And uh, welcome to Wright Mulders. <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. I'll send those questions over immediately. Perfect. Have Fantastic. a wonderful evening. Will do. Or day. I'm not sure what time of day it is there where you are. It's uh, it's uh, twenty past uh, eight 
Uh, sorry, 20 past six at night. Okay. <laughs> but you have a lovely day as well. Thank you. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye.